Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Essary. I'm an assistant professor here at Reich University. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speaker is Christopher Lucas from Harvard University. He's giving a talk entitled The Speaker Affect Model for Measuring Emotion in Political Speech with Audio Data. And based on the background, I, I hope that Lord of the Rings is going to be part of this presentation. So I, I'll, I'll find out in a minute, I guess. Uh, Chris's talk is uh, going to last between about 30 and 40 minutes, after which point we will take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. A link to Chris's slideshow will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window, so you may refer to it throughout the presentation, and I'll post that link right after Chris gets started. Uh, and now I would like to welcome Christopher Lucas to the International Methods Colloquium. Chris, welcome. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Justin, for, for having me and, and for putting this on. Um, so I'm uh, excited to, to present today uh, joint work with Dean Knox, uh, who is a graduate student at MIT, soon to be uh, a professor at Princeton. Um, so we've been working on a, on a, uh, a sort of large project, uh, of which there are a few different papers, uh, studying uh, audio as data. So today I'll be presenting sort of the the workhorse model that we've developed and applied, uh, the speaker affect model. So if you've seen sort of the, the feature length Hollywood version of this talk, you'll know that Sam, uh, the speaker affect model, Sam is uh, highly sensitive to the emotions of his traveling companions. Uh, we're going to be focusing today on, on a sort of more condensed version of, of Sam, um, which broadly models different modes of speech. So um, you could be thinking here about kind of the way that uh, you talk, um, versus the way that I talk, uh, the way that I talk when I'm angry versus when I'm, I'm sort of neutral or, or ambivalent, right? Um, the sounds that we make in these different modes. Uh, but we might then ask uh, sort of, firstly, why, why emotion? Say, say we can model these modes and say in fact that, that this works, uh, why would emotion in politics matter? So rather than sort of cite a lot of literature and, and try to make some, some case, I, I want to show you or, or sort of do a little um, demonstration of kind of why we think this might matter. So uh, I'm going to play for you a clip uh, by uh, Barack Obama in the, the run up to the 2008 um, election. And imagine as he's speaking, uh, reading the words on text versus sort of uh, the, the sort of way that you're perceiving them as you listen to him talk. So, so here's that clip. One voice can change a room. And if it can change a room, it can change a city. And if it can change a city, it can change a state. And if it can change a state, it can change a nation. And if it can change a nation, it can change the world. So, so when I hear that uh, that speech, right, that that, that uh, monologue, if I imagine reading those words, of course, they, they wouldn't have the same kind of gravity that they have uh, when when uh, Obama sort of speaks them in that way, right? Um, so, uh, of course, it would seem that sort of emotions and, and the way the words are spoken uh, matters. Um, and this obviously isn't a, a new sort of novel claim. Uh, there are, are massive literatures in political science about emotion and politics, uh, much of political psychology, um, and, and, and of course, uh, you can think of other literatures in, in sort of uh, the way that these sort of emotions might frame the way we perceive information, assess risk, any number of possible applications. Um, so yes, we think emotions matter, um, but given that, number one, how, how are we to study them? How are we to study something as nuanced as emotion in, in speech? So uh, that's the task that we undertake here. Um, so a sort of basic roadmap of, of what we were going to walk through in this talk today is as follows. So first, I'm going to give a, a brief intro into audio as data, right? Uh, political science in general hasn't uh, thought about using audio data and modeling it, so, so I'm going to sort of explain what that is. Two, I'm going to introduce the model. Uh, three, I'm going to, to demonstrate it with uh, a corpus of, of oral arguments from the Supreme Court. And four, I'm going to show and uh, demonstrate some results uh, with that data where we're going to do a benchmark against other alternative methods and then uh, some early results comparing with text only approaches. So, uh, what is audio data, right? Um, 
You can imagine a, a simple utterance, a sort of four or five second piece of, of human speech recorded in some MP3 on, on your computer, right? Maybe a sentence that I speak. Uh, here is a little short, short visual representation. And imagine uh, sort of the, the y-axis here connoting uh, time, right? So, so we move from the top down and move through time. Uh, and across the x-axis, across the top, some sort of audio features. And then where where our sort of uh, sub-components of, of this, uh, this block, right, are sort of brief frames, brief moments it, it, as we sort of move through this five second utterance of speech. So how could we characterize this? What, what sort of numeric representations could we give to, to say what's inside this sort of uh, mysterious block of sound? So as you may remember from, uh, from various points in your education, um, Audio is, is just a, a pressure uh, wave rate of sort of peaks and troughs, high and low pressure. Um, and so uh, here, here we're sort of plotting one such wave. This uh, horizontal line uh, is basically the, the sort of baseline pressure in the room. Um, so a mic, right, is picking up uh, the pressure uh, against it or the lack thereof, right? Your eardrums are picking up that pressure and that's what's giving it sort of the perception of sound, right? And from this raw audio, uh, without any kind of uh, transformation or, or any sort of uh, computation, we can already start thinking of, of uh, ways we could summarize it, right? So first, we could um, count sort of the, the frequency with which we're crossing that, uh, that sort of zero mark, right? Um, that's going to be a feature we're going to use, the zero crossing rate. Um, we could use the uh, sort of loudness, right? A another feature that's present here. Um, but, but we can do more than just that. That probably wouldn't be enough, right, to, to sort of really characterize what's in that, that audio wave. Um, so if you look at it, right, you'll know that it's sort of going up and down sort of with a common kind of uh, trend, right? Uh, well, we can, it turns out, back that out itself. And so that would look something like this. And that, um, that uh, which we, we, we calculate, has its own sort of, um, its own sort of uh, name in, in uh, audio features. And that's sort of the fundamental frequency. And here, this is sort of the, the perceived pitch, right? So if you play any instruments, right, if, if you play guitar, um, you, you probably often tune your guitar to A440, right? Uh, so A440 is just sort of the perceived pitch, but of course, um, you can also play A440 on a piano, right? So if you imagine uh, playing A440 on a guitar versus A440 on a, a piano, they sound, of course, very different, even though this fundamental frequency is the same. And this is because of these sort of higher level resonances, right? So we can also uh, calculate those. And those, resonance are, right, those resonances are going to be what gives it sort of the, the particular timbre that sets it apart from just that fundamental frequency that you're going to hear. Uh, we can go further, right, and so we can take the discrete Fourier transform and uh, convert the function from its original uh, domain of pressure over time into energy over frequency. So here we've, we've plotted that, um, and uh, after we've done that, right, we can then bin up uh, the energy across certain ranges of this frequency and then uh, use the energy within those ranges uh, to summarize sort of the, the energy in a particular part of the frequency spectrum. So those coefficients then are going to be other uh, features that we use. So basically uh, loudness in some, some low range or some high range or, or mid range. Um, so to, to return to our original illustration of this sort of uh, frame by frame utterance, we can now fill in sort of this, uh, the features that we're using to, to describe this data. So we have stuff like bass power, sort of soprano power. So this is the, the energy in the low versus the upper registers, um, zero crossing rate, pitch, the formant, sort of the, the shimmery kind of uh, higher uh, uh, descriptions of the way the sounding, uh, and then derivatives of these features, because of course, again, they're, they're derivatives with your, or sort of features with respect to, to some movement through time. So we can take the first second derivatives and, and include those as well. But of course, we, we don't just have a single utterance that we're interested in, right? So uh, in that uh, piece of, of speech that we heard from President Obama, um, that wasn't a five second piece of speech. It was uh, maybe a 30 second piece of speech. And in say the case of the oral arguments that we're going to listen to later, uh, we don't just have a single five second piece of speech. We have uh, many, many, many little utterances of the speech. So, we then uh, can imagine having these utterances sort of piled on top of each other, stacked on top of each other, uh, moving sort of through time, right? 
So our model in the, the sort of highest level or, or most abstractive senses is going to, to be doing as follows. So um, imagine again, uh, each of these little blocks of speech being these utterances, uh, which are described by these, these frames, which are, are constituted by these features. We want to classify those utterances as being in different modes of speech. So here again, you can imagine that this first utterance being in mode one, second and third in mode two. What do we mean again by mode? You could think again of this being speaker one versus speaker two. Uh, you can imagine this being uh, emotion one versus emotion two, um, and this is what we want to model. This is this is fundamental what, we're, what we want to be able to do. We want to classify these utterances according to their mode of speech. So, what is the speaker affect model? Not using statistics, it's using imagination. So you, you might sit and think uh, that that it, it sort of seems like this difficult task, but but with the statistics, uh, we can of course get, get leverage on this this very sort of uh, complicated. Uh, classification task. And so, uh, of course, it is using statistics. Um, so the model of speech is this. Um, so again, we have our um, our features across uh, our uh, x-axis here. Um, and instead of our utterances then being these sort of colorless frames, um, we're going to basically model each utterance as being constituted by sort of different sounds, right? So, so here we, you can imagine some sound uh, like a big vowel sound or a hissing sound. Um, and, and within each of those utterances, you're going to be transitioning between those sounds and uh, you could return to that sound or, or it could appear in multiple utterances, right? Uh, but this is going to, to be sort of the, the way that we're going to model speech. And so emotion one, right, is going to be composed of certain transitions between certain sounds and emotion two of different ones, right? Um, so you could imagine, again, sort of plosives or, or sort of, again, these sort of uh, big sort of vowel sounds. Right? And, and so to kind of be a little bit more specific about, about what we mean here with, with some more notation, speech is going to be here a sequence of utterances, right? And each utterance then has a mode of speech. And this is, is fundamentally our, our quantity of interest. Um, so then utterance, utterances are then going to be these sequences of frames, right? In each frame, a sound is going to be pronounced. And then sounds generate audio features. And, uh, and this, is, this is basically, basically the, the, these are the, the blocks we have to work with. So uh, to, to be a bit more specific with the actual model, what we want to then do inference on is the, the modes of speech at the utterance level. And then we get those from the frame level data. So uh, the mode of speech then is flowing back and forth according to, to this sort of uh, first order HMM. Given the mode, the sounds uh, are also going to be governed by this HMM. And then the content of the sound is going to vary uh, so these sounds are going to be sort of features generated from uh, some sort of big, sort of uh, hundred-dimensional normal. So, so you can imagine again sort of a, a vowel sound being sort of again constituted by this this big Gaussian. Um, so if you're the sort of person who likes uh, plate notation, this uh, this might sort of clarify things for you. Um, so this is this is one utterance. So usage of sounds here uh, is gamma. Content then is, is the theta parameter. And so we can zoom out and get a better sense kind of of this transition between these utterances. So uh, the switches there, so now again, we have uh, all of the utterances, right? Moving from left to right. And the switches then are, are, are uh, going to be uh, this delta parameter in the top. So I'm not going to go too deep here into the, the way we're going to, going to do estimation, uh, but we're going to be doing estimation that's sort of basically in uh, with the forward backward algorithm. So the E step is basically going to be, when did uh, emotions happen? When did, they, when did they switch? The M step is going to be sort of what makes up the emotions, right? These sound distributions. And then uh, what distributions triggered these transitions? Um, and, and so uh, we're going to move back and forth between these. And if, if there are questions, I'm happy to, happy to talk more about that in the queue. And uh, this is going to be implemented in RCPP uh, in SAM, uh, which uh, is in the uh, sort of alpha stages of development at the moment. So uh, what's SAM look like? Uh, what is, let's move from sort of uh, just describing it and defining the model to, to some actual real data. So 
Um, we fit the model to a uh, speech of, of President Obama, and, and this is what we got. So uh, this, this sort of a large panel of, of uh, panels, right, is, is as follows. So the, the rows are our dimension, right, and the columns are the same dimensions. Um, so the, each plot then is a 2D slice of, of this very high dimensional feature space. So we could zoom in and get a better sense of, of what's inside of here. And so here, the y-axis is, is in this particular panel, or in this particular row, right? Uh, the first row in, in this, um, th these rows of, of features uh, corresponds to the first formant, which is one of these resonant frequencies that we talked about. Um, so the interpretation here is that lower values are uh, sort of back vowels, uh, vowels that are in the back of your your uh, your throat. Higher higher values are are in the front. So like ah versus e, right? You can you can feel ah in the back, e in the front. Um, so so this is sort of what's on the y axis. Um, the left axis or the left x axis. So so the left panel of, of these two panels is uh, is loudness on the x axis here. So the left panel is uh, loudness by uh, the first formant. And in this panel, uh, the black dots are, are frames, right? Again, if you think back to our discussion of the utterances, these are the little uh, slices of, of each of those utterances. And um, the same points on each, or the same points in, in this frame, all the points in this frame exist on other frames. So the points are shared across these frames. And the reason that they're distributed differently, of course, is that we're slicing them in different 2D spaces. Um, so, so these are just different slices of, of the same uh, frames distributed in space. And by looking at the data here, we can start to get a sense of, of, uh, of sort of what these uh, different um, labels start to mean, right? These learned colors. Um, and so uh, here, it, the uh, the rings are, are these sort of sound labels. So uh, we can interpret these. The orange label here is, is, is it turns out silence, right? Which is why it's so low in both corners, right? Uh, it sort of uh, has, has low values in, in both the, the loudness and, and this first formant. Um, and, and we can interpret the green, it probably is a sibilant, which is sort of an S sound, right? Um, and we can interpret all the different colors this way. So we can zoom out a little bit more and see uh, a bit more about how these are distributed. And if we interpreted them, uh, we, we might we would come to the following uh, conclusions, which is that here the red is a, is a sort of generic um, sort of sound. Uh, the the orange is a low intensity kind of silence. Uh, again, the the yellow is sort of a, a mid range uh, sort of vowel, right? Um, the the green is a sibilant, but maybe we don't quite know what the what the blue is, right? So. To kind of open that up, uh, let's listen again to that um, that recording of, of Obama, and uh, we're going to plot again the um, the the label along the uh, x-axis here, and we're going to move through the recording and, and uh, listen as we go through. I'll try to point out when we're in the different uh, sort of labels. So first, right, we're going to jump into this, this red generic, and then the orange is going to be silence, right? So, oh, um, voice can do. One voice can change your room. And if right, it so can change a room, room it can the change yellow, the city. city, the green. And if it can change the city, it can change the, the state. orange. Yep, silent, right? And, if it and then there's that blue the again. State, What's that blue? It can change the nation. Here's more of it. And right. if it can change the nation, it can change the world. World, right? The big, uh, the big vowel again, right? So obviously the the blue, it turns out, what was it? It, it was sort of audience sound, right? Uh, the sound of applause. Um. And so uh, the result of that, to, to, to visualize it differently, is sort of this, um, this uh, in Markov model uh, displayed by these transition probabilities between these states. So um, to uh, sort of review, what did we actually just see putting it all together? Um, the basic uh, uh, sort of uh, thing that we just saw was this. So, so experts here, right, uh, sort of determine uh, what the uh, speaking modes are, the rubric. Um, humans then code up those speaking modes uh, for uh, the training set, right? So we have some, some assigned rubric of labels and then some, some RAs or, or whatever uh, coding the data. And then uh, we have an unsupervised HMM for each speaking mode. So basically we've modeled each of the modes um, 
according to this unsupervisation mem that is learned, uh, right, and automatically classifying these sounds according to the, the usage and the content. And then a supervised HMM, uh, which is or which corresponds to the different modes of speech, right? Where each of those modes again is defined as one of these uh, uh, interior sort of unsupervised HMMs. And so that supervised HMM is going to be a, a model sort of the flow of speech through uh, the recording, uh, sort of to, to sort of model the usage of these different speaking modes, how the modes are changing over the course of speech, the interplay in the speaking modes between people. So that uh, we could again look at as follows. So here again, the sort of inner wheels of, of this big wheel of, of, uh, of speaking modes are these unsupervised HMMs. Uh, the outer wheels are the, the supervised, um, sort of classified uh, utterance uh, labels, right? And uh, the quantity of interest again that we want are, are the, the states for each of the different utterances that we're modeling. So let's move forward into, into some data. Um, so uh, we're going to use oral arguments, right? Um, this is data that we, we scraped from the, the OEA project, uh, 782 recordings from the Roberts Court, Roberts Court roughly 800 hours in total. Uh, it very conveniently is accompanied by timestamps time transcripts with speaker labels. And so we segment, uh, each of these oral arguments into utterances, the result of which is a total of 454,000 utterances. So then we pool lawyers together and we analyze each justice separately. And then we extract 81 features for each 25 millisecond window. So I'm gonna show you two things. Uh, first, uh, let's do a very simple validation exercise with, with this uh, Supreme Court data. So this is a fairly easy task. Uh, we're going to distinguish between 11 course modes of speech. Um, so those course modes are going to be uh, the, the justice who, who spoke them. So this is going to be uh, modes like speech by Alito, speech by Breyer, uh, justices within the Roberts Court. And then uh, you can imagine, though, it, more generally, right, um, it, other applications were interested in labeling sort of who the speaker is. So, so one of the applications that uh, Dean and I are interested in doing in the future is a sort of a deliberation experiment, right? Where you can imagine recording audio of some deliberation in the lab or, or a field experiment, right? Uh, where people are prompted in some sort of um, political psych, Druckmann style uh, experiment to, to deliberate about some, some question or, or not, right? And you can have participants self-introduce at the beginning, right? So, so you have some label uh, early on when they have some, some speech and then automatically generate the transcript with some other software that um, Dean, uh, Dustin Tingley and I have, have worked on uh, to automatically uh, transcribe uh, recordings. And then uh, we could learn a model of speech uh, from uh, those sort of labeled early segments and then use those models to label the transcript, right? And then we could both jointly analyze the text and then we could also think about analyzing uh, the, the audio too. So uh, what we're going to do here is draw 100 utterances per justice, so only 11 total, um, and then evaluate the, the out of sample predictive accuracy uh, with cross validation. So again, the key thing here is, is sort of, uh, this is all out of sample. Um, and uh, again, so we're gonna test this against um, another alternative way of, of doing uh, audio classification. So in R and Python at present, the only available library that, that you could use is Pi Audio Analysis, which is a widely used Python library for audio classification. Um, again, the only alternative to, to SAM and uh, we're going to benchmark SAM against uh, the various models available in Pi Audio Analysis. And so Pi Audio Analysis supports uh, uh, audio classification with SVMs, gradient boosting, random forest, uh, randomized trees. And it's important to note, right, that by contra or in contrast to SAM, these, mo these mo methods aren't modeling speech dynamics, right? So SAM's specifically about these transitions between modes of speech, whereas Pi Audio Analysis isn't, isn't particularly catering uh, or particularly uh, modeling those, those uh, transitions. So uh, the results of this horse race are as follows. So the best Pi audio analysis model uh, by out of sample accuracy uh, uh, was this one. So uh, the, the plot that you're looking at here has the predicted speaker along the x-axis, the true speaker along the y-axis. So if we look just at the results for uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
96% uh, of the time, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was uh, the actual speaker, uh, Pi Audio Analysis uh, predicted that, that RBG was in fact the speaker, right? So that seems really good. Um, and, and the other, you know, 1% of the time, uh, Kagan, 1% uh, of the time, Sandra Day O'Connor, so on. Um, how did it do on the, on the rest of the, the justices? Well, increasingly worse. So uh, it turns out Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, was the easiest to classify. Uh, in general, the, the female justices were, were all sort of among the easiest to classify. So four of the top five uh, uh, sort of uh, best uh, performing uh, labels for pilot analysis were, were the, the four female justices. Um, and all the way down at the bottom, uh, Justice Roberts at, at 62%. So uh, maybe not terrible, but but not not fantastic. So overall accuracy at, at 85%. By contrast, um, the best speaker affect model uh, classification by out of sample accuracy was as follows. So keeping the uh, and again this is our model keeping the the y axis labels fixed right so the same order. Um, None of the, the justices, uh, or all of the justices were correctly classified uh, in over 90% of, of uh, cases, right? So RBG, again, uh, classified uh, successfully 99% of the time. Roberts, right, 91% uh, of the time compared to 62% of the time with, with pi audio analysis. Um, so, so, of course, it is, it is very fair to say that, that in, at least this head-to-head um, uh, CM is winning. And the overall accuracy there is, is 97%. So compared to, again, 85 with my audio analysis. Uh, to put those results differently, here um, on the in the top panel, uh, we have uh, CM. And what we've done is, is plot the, the accuracy across sort of uh, the best models from various uh, parameter initializations. So uh, again, in the second panel, SVMs, and then uh, trees, random forest. Um, and the thing to note here is that the worst performing model um, from Sam outperformed all of the other models, uh, the best performing models uh, from, from Pi Audio Analysis. So uh, that, that seems sort of, it seems fair to say that, that uh, we're improving upon uh, the, the sort of existing approaches in that, in that way. Uh, let's sort of look a little bit differently than at how classification is, is working. So, uh, drop all the other justices, and let's just do sort of a, a model where we're trying to correctly classify justices as being one versus the other. So, so specifically here, imagine we're trying to classify utterances as being or belonging to either Scalia or Alito. Um, so this panel here uh, is uh, the log likelihood of, of utterances under a model of Scalia, uh, and so this dotted line then uh, represents basically indifference, which right? so it could be equally likely uh, one or the other. And the thing to note is that um, when the model sort of thinks that it's it's Scalia, in fact, it truly is, right? And when it thinks it's it's Alito, it in fact is. Uh, with only a few sort of black dots, you'll see below that dotted line uh, for Scalia. Uh, now we could look at that similarly with with head-to-head uh, -head comparisons with Scalia and all the other justices, and those all look similarly uh, distinguished, right? Um, so it's the same kind of separation for uh, Breyer, O'Connor, Ginsburg, Kagan, and so on. And, and this isn't just uh, Scalia. This is sort of a, a general, uh, or the general way that the, the data look. Um, so uh, now that we, we are sort of confident that we can do the sort of uh, speaker classification, let's think about another mode of speech, emotion classification. So uh, here we're just going to gesture at, at some preliminary results before uh, we sort of wrap up. and. Um, the preliminary results here are as follows. So uh, we uh, did the following. We coded 200 utterances by uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Um, and those modes of speech were neutral 64% of the time, skeptical 36% of the time. Um, and so it's worth noting that sort of perceived skepticism depends both on the text and the tone, right? And uh, existing Supreme Court sentiment only uses the text of these utterances. Um, so you might wonder sort of, uh, or it is worth wondering in this sort of emotion classification by contrast with sort of the, the uh, speaker classification, is it the case that we could get uh, the, the uh, emotion classification with just the text, say? Um, so uh, in fact, uh, we're going to show that, that you cannot. So, uh, the, so Sam selected 
uh, by K-fold cross validation um, was uh, performing at, at 70% accuracy out of sample uh, and a true positive rate of uh, 71% uh, and a true negative rate of, of 70%. By contrast, comparing that against by audio analysis, uh, there's some overall accuracy was 61%, uh, true positive 58, true negative at, at 63. And then, um, so, so those are still sort of uh, sentiment or sort of emotional classification using the audio. What if we turned to, um, to uh, sort of state of the art sentiment classification with the text? So, uh, we used a, a recursive neural net, uh, the Stanford Core NLP uh, deep uh, net, and the vast majority of these segments were then classified as, as negative. Um, and, and so what does that mean? So an overall accuracy of 45% uh, with a, a predictive accuracy of 89%, but of course that uh, was driven by the fact that basically all the time it was guessing one of the two labels, right? Um, so, uh, able to successfully classify one label because that was in fact always the case. Um, so to, to look at that differently, to sort of deep dive in, here it's worth noting that we've, so originally we called the model feeler. Uh, we decided that that sort of had a, a bad ring to it and, and have changed it to Sam. So feeler here um, is, is Sam. And so what we're plotting here again is the, the true positive rate on the y-axis, the, the accuracy on the x, um, and the dotted line connotes random guessing. And so the thing worth noting again is that um, Pi audio analysis is uh, regularly performing, um, in particular on true positive rate, considerably worse than a random guess might even perform. Um, whereas that's never the case with one of the models learned by, by Sam. So uh, to conclude, we're introducing sort of uh, new sources of data for, for social scientists. Um, we've, we've studied text, um, and we have theories about emotion and, uh, and sentiment, but we, we sort of lack the models to, to really deep, dive, dive into the, to those, um, to those questions and to study them rigorously. Um, we're opening up new questions about political speech, right? So uh, questions about how, say, in the context of, of an oral argument, uh, an interjection from a, a justice might uh, change responses by lawyers, or maybe how uh, one sort of emotional response from a justice or a lawyer might change the, the responses of others, right, to the dynamics of the, these sort of deliberative kind of uh, bodies. Uh, similarly, in, um, in sort of, you might think about uh, legislative speech, right, how if one uh, one parliamentarian makes sort of a, a sort of angry or, or sort of hot comment, how does that sort of, um, influence or change the, the uh, downstream, uh, downstream uh, dynamics of the, of the discussion. And uh, we make advances over state-of-the-art models in computer science. Um, so are not only sort of opening up new questions in political science and providing sort of a, a new uh, literature, but um, also sort of advancing uh, just general uh, computational and statistical learning. Um, so uh, just to briefly flag some ongoing work, um, uh, Dean and I are, are in the middle of sort of incorporating text in, into, into CM and more generally are, are interested in, in sort of joint text and audio analysis. Um, we have other applied um, papers using this model. So uh, one with, with Max Kuplerud, who's a graduate student at Harvard, on uh, sort of the rhetoric again of, of sort of parliament uh, or parliamentary speech. Uh, and so here again, thinking about how uh, the way that emotional uh, sort of outbursts or, or, or negative sentiment on uh, the floor of some parliament might sort of shift or change speech dynamics on the floor. Um, and then, and so my own work in, in my dissertation, I uh, am sort of also looking at visual features and, and text, right? So, so here again, thinking about incorporating these other features that often uh, go along with or accompany text into their analysis rather than sort of ignoring them because they're, they're difficult. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll, I'll conclude and, and open it up for questions and, and thanks a lot for listening. All right, uh, thank you, Chris, for that presentation. Uh, at this point, Christopher Lucas is available to take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, uh, the first thing uh, the first I, I'm thing curious about is it, it seems like this is uh, this kind of work is probably um, closely connected to linguistics, closely connected to 
um, psychology, uh, since it has to do with both uh, speech and emotion. And and uh, yet there were no citations to any psychologist or any linguists in your in your talk. So I, I, I assume uh, you have looked at this stuff, and so and I'm I'm you know I'm a methodologist. I don't know jack about either one of those. <laughs> so can you can you sort of fill me in on what's going on in those disciplines? Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. So um, that, that's a, a great a great point. Um, I I sort of loathe the the page of citations, but, but maybe uh, maybe we were too 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 light on them this time. So um, in in the sort of signal processing, you're absolutely right. There is a a, a large literature in signal processing and, and computer science on uh, this task in particular, even. And they've in that literature even used HMMs for some of this sort of mode of speech classification. Um, so with respect to that literature, uh, we're making a couple of, of advancements. So um, I didn't talk about it today, but um, those models, firstly, uh, so, so we, we introduced a, a sort of regularization step um, in the incorporation of, of the features, which is why we're able to use 81 features instead of five or six or seven, um, which is is what all of those existing models in, in computer science are doing. Um, oddly enough, that there are sort of five to 10 features. Um, and so we've done some sort of early benchmarking against those and, and have, as you might expect, um, dropping in that regularization step and, and including more features and previous performance. Um, it is for, so far as sort of validation goes also, uh, most of that literature, all of that literature, in fact, that, that with sort of maybe one or two exceptions, is on really, really like sanitary data. So data like actors who are paid to come in and and uh, and say, be angry or be happy or something like this. So it's very, very extreme and kind of easy to classify. Um, and in part because sort of the only, the only people who are interested in, in computation and who also would want to work with data as messy as, as this, you know, they're only really political scientists and social scientists. So uh, we were sort of trying to, to validate and test against against sort of levels of, of or types of speech that are considerably, considerably subtler and maybe messier than a lot of the computer scientists are. So in a way are kind of tackling like a harder task also. Um, the, the psych stuff is, is interesting too. So we began, so the, the literature that we actually kind of started in was this literature by Entman about sort of big five kind of emotional states. Um, and expected that we'd kind of walk into to political science and, and find cases of, you know, those big five emotions. And it turns out, maybe not surprisingly in hindsight, that a lot of those sort of real kind of modes of speech you see aren't the ones that psych is often interested in, like anger or, or whatever. It's subtle or like skepticism versus not. It's sort of more like in the, in the oral argument case, the, the thing I kept on coming back to when we were thinking about the rubric was like, if you imagine presenting a paper to an audience, you really get two kinds of vocal tones. You get the vocal tone that's like, I'm uh, I'm sincerely asking you a question because I want to learn. And you get the vocal tone of, I really don't believe anything you're saying, and so I'm very skeptical, right? And that's not like a, a level or a type of sort of uh, a mode of speech that a psychologist would have, would have thought about. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Well, so, you know, so, so what, you, what you mentioned is, is sort of the, at the beginning, the the technical sort of well, we, <laughs> we're we're using this particular model that allows yeah. for greater flexibility. I'm I'm really interested more in theory, and let me let me sort of explain what I mean. So, <clears throat> for example, when I when I when I watch a a, a politician speak on on C-SPAN or in a debate or something, I I am a classification machine of of a of a kind, and I often assume that the the things I'm seeing, like I can, for example. I can classify that Donald Trump is angry a lot, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the takeaway that I get from that. What I, you know, first of all, politicians often lie, right? That's a that's a pretty mm -hmm. fundamental thing. They they do things for rhetorical effect, which are not really what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, and the things I'm I'm interested in are not necessarily detecting whether they're, you know, whether they're uh, angry or not. I'm, I'm maybe interested in, for example, whether they're lying. Or, or whether they really believe the thing they're saying, right? That would be of something of interest to me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious about sort of the the theory that underpins the the mode of learning that is going on in the model, because obviously some assumptions have to be made about sort of what the what the DGP is in some sense. Mm -hmm. And when I think about political speech, I you know there, there's stuff on the surface, right? There's there's 
you can tell that someone's angry or someone's upset or something. But there's also a lot going on under the surface, and a lot of it's strategic. And I'm I'm curious about how that relates to what the theory behind your model is, and and sort of how that relates to other theories of political communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great a great point. So um, we've. For instance, uh, with, with the, the Supreme Court case, uh, the, the application of the Supreme Court, I should say, um, we're, for instance, interested in, in an application paper that, that we haven't started yet, um, where we're looking at or thinking about the way that justices might strategically display certain kinds of modes of speech in order to signal either um, sort of their commitment to, to some issue or not. Right? So you can imagine maybe that uh, taking a firm stand um, on an issue signals something like strict opposition. Maybe that has downstream consequences on subsequent questions that are asked, or maybe on sort of uh, how important a particular part of, of the, the opinion that's to be decided might sort of uh, be to you, right? And so you think about kind of the way that that would be a part of some bargaining process. Um, similarly, right, in exactly in the paper with Max Kupler in, uh, that I didn't mention, or that I mentioned but, but didn't present, uh, we motivated a theory again about kind of how um, politicians might uh, strategically take or use emotional rhetoric to position take in the run up to elections and how that would sort of be a, a, a sort of strategy available to parliamentarians um, to sort of uh, signal to, to constituents versus to, to fellow uh, people in, in, in the, the parliamentary body. So I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the, we, we think those are interesting, fascinating questions. Uh, in this case, for instance, I mean, maybe we can all look, it, we absolutely agree that you can listen to, to a parliamentarian and say this person's angry. And if you couldn't, we couldn't have like any kind of coding rules, right? Um, but what we think is that your time is more valuable than say the ability to listen to say like uh, tens of thousands of hours of, of court cases or something like that, right? Um, so so it, in order to, to sort of extend your ability to interpret one particular utterance, um, you know, we need a model. And then also uh, there's sort of intuition that we can get from the model about sort of like uh, the transition probabilities, for instance, uh, can give us intuition about the way that uh, being sort of angry might change downstream, um, downstream things by, by shifting us into a, a different state. So it's a great, uh, yeah, I, we totally agree. We're not, we're, we're absolutely on board. I guess what I'm, tr um, what I'm really sort of trying to, uh, in real, because this is obviously something that it's pretty new. Not, there aren't a lot of political scientists thinking about the information that's encoded in, plenty of political scientists think about the information that's encoded in text, right? But we're not thinking about the information that's encoded in, in what you might call rhetoric or, or the, the, the mode of speaking. Um, I, I, what I'm, I'm trying to sort of think about in real time here is what is the information that's contained in the, the things I'm saying that aren't the text, right? So skepticism, maybe, uh, maybe some clues. I know there are really sophisticated machines that are supposed to figure out whether you're lying or not, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you figure that out, you could probably sell it to the CIA or something mm -hmm. um, or you know, the court system. Mm -hmm. um, what, what what is it that's that's sort of encoded in our in our in our non text part of speech that's going to be really sort of a game changing insight for a political scientist? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think um, I mean, if uh, so, so I, I would say again, I think a in order to answer the question, what is encoded? We need sort of a, a way to to measure. Uh, whatever, to measure something, right? So, so if it is the case that we can observe these differences, you know, a way to formalize that and to study it is sort of necessary for really coming to, to good kind of answers about it, um, instead of us sort of all kind of saying what we think we know. But um, it, it's, a, it's a good question. And, and I think the, um, you know, again, I, I think we would think that, that something like the, the strength of conviction, right, can be conveyed by the way you say something, or um, the sort of valence of your position on something can be conveyed by the way you say something. The whole meaning can flip by the way you say something, right? Something can, the text might, if read, sound Donald totally Trump is such a great president, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. right. So, so you know, it's, it's one of these things where uh, absolutely the, and I, I mean, I, you know, I, like text and, and work on text. So, so it's not that I'm saying no one study text anymore, right? Um, but uh, that, you know, sort of um, the, 
if it is the case that we can flip the meaning of a sentence by the way we say it, um, then it, it seems fair to start with the, the position um, that there's some information then conveyed in the way that we say something. So now, now you're right. Interesting as, as sort of metadata, you can imagine mm -hmm. sort of, I see your first ongoing work here is, uh, actually I would probably change the framing, incorporating mm -hmm. audio analysis into text, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of how do right. we, you know, how do we, for example, when someone says, I think Donald Trump's a great president, right. versus, I think Donald Trump's such a great president, you know, that that's really a, a very different meaning. Right, right, right. I have another, have, oh, go ahead, please go ahead. Oh, no, 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 just anecdotally, even there were so many great cases on, on sort of congressional floor speeches or whatever of exactly that, someone right. just saying something and meaning exactly the opposite, especially in sort of uh, British parliament debate where, where people are just so... <laughs> yeah, they're mean. Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, one, actually that, that, that transitions is something I'm curious about. I, I have to believe that there's a lot of cultural and linguistics specificity. So for example, mm -hmm. if you took your model that was trained on American politicians and you sort of ran German uh, parliamentary discussion or British parliamentary, even British, which is the same language, parliamentary discussion through it, you'd you'd get different answers or the answers would be wrong, right? So um, because the the norms, in some cases, the, the, the norms of the language are different. In some cases, the norms of the culture are different. And is there anything, you know, have you, have you looked at sort of, have you spent any time looking at whether there are things we can learn about political cultures that are encoded in how they use language? Uh, that's interesting. That's a, so, um, we hadn't, we hadn't approached I like that because that flips a, uh, sort of methodological kind of, uh, task we'd been thinking about into kind of a research question, which is always a good move. So, so we'd been thinking about kind of how do we think about uh, how can we get leverage in these very different places with the data that we have, kind of, and that's good because it, it turns it into a, a research question. So, no, I, I, I we haven't thought exactly about that. What what we're doing at the moment really is is um, you know if if you don't have good training data for a person, then then you can't really classify them. That's effectively what's what's happening. So uh, we've thought about ways to kind of uh, get kind of more leverage out of sample, but but your intuition is totally right that um, when you don't know anything about a particular person, the way they express things, and it's it's hard to to train. Once well, it so becomes, it turns into a bit of an unsupervised learning problem, right? You wanna mm -hmm. you wanna discover what the differences are mm -hmm. uh, in patterns. Um, mm -hmm. versus sort of a supervised learning problem where you sort of know the structure and you're just trying to get a machine to do it for you. We have a couple of questions from our audience. I, I don't wanna I don't wanna hold them back with my pontificating. So uh, uh, Philip Hunsaker asks, uh, if I understood correctly, the features that uh, SAM uses for classification, for example, the mode of speech states, are generated independently from the final classification task. Could you perhaps increase the performance of your model if instead you opted for an end-to-end -end classification approach, that is, one where the features are learned during the training of the classification model, as is common in deep learning literature? And this is almost exactly what we were just talking about. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So we haven't played around with uh, so so as I, I I don't I don't know if I mentioned this, but but in in uh, much of my dissertation, I'm I'm doing stuff with with uh, neural nets and. Um, the the big I think it'd be I know of course in, in audio classification there's um, there's a, a lot of work and increasingly a lot of work on using uh, neural networks for for these tasks. Um, the big cost I think that would impose is that we just need a whole lot more data. Um, so it might be the case if we had a lot of data that we could learn uh, something about those features. In this case, right in our classification task in our benchmarking, we only had a hundred. Uh, utterances and the utterances are five seconds long um, of, of training data. So uh, if we're thinking about training data that's that short, I highly doubt that we'd get any sort of anything reasonable from, from a, a neural network. Um, but it would be interesting to think about how that would scale and, and at what point maybe it'd be, it'd be interesting to or it'd be worth kind of learning those features. Yeah, but that's a good, good point. That's actually, so the uh, an anonymous viewer asked how much training data you need for an individual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, a lot of it obviously is gonna depend on kind of the subtlety of the task. So uh, when it comes obviously to, to classifying something as being uh, Roberts versus Ginsburg, probably very, 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 very little. We didn't scale down to like the point at which you cease to be able to do it, but 
like count on your fingers and your toes, you know, um, if it were when it's, you know, detecting sarcasm, uh, then considerably more. Right. Um, so, so I don't think there's one general rule for it. Um, but again, we were working with really, really small training sets here, like, uh, again, a hundred, um, a hundred utterances per, per speaker. So not that much, the kind of stuff that you can do, you know, at night when you're bored. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so, and, and like you said before, if you were going to try to, to learn from the data, you would obviously have to gra drastically increase the amount of training data you had in order to actually get something meaningful out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you mentioned that this, uh, this software package is an alpha. When do you think it's going to be ready for prime time? Oh, that's a great question. Um, hopefully when, um, the paper's accepted in the journal for sure. Um, no, the, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it works obviously. It just needs all the, um, the, uh, the polishing. So, so Dean was on the market. I'm going to be on the market. So we have other, other things we're juggling too, but, but soon I hope. Okay. Well, this was really interesting. I, I have to say, this is probably one of the more original, uh, uh talks I've, I've heard. I'm really interested in this topic. I want to thank you for appearing today. Uh, I also want to, um, uh, uh, plug our next week's broadcast. So uh, next week at uh, on March 24th at noon Eastern time, we will host a talk by Benjamin T. Jones of the University of Mississippi. Ben's talk is based on co-authored work with Shauna Metzger and is entitled Asking About Which, Improving Substantive Interpretation of Duration Models. You can see our website, www.methods-colloquium.com to get more information about this talk and the rest of our schedule for the spring of 2017. And, and Christopher, thank you very much for, for being a part of the, of the IMC today. Thank you. All right. See everybody next week.